Hey everybody, welcome to another On This Day in Canadian Military History live stream. Uh, my name is Brad. I haven't been saying that lately, so I'm going to start off by saying who I am. Uh, my name is Brad. I have a PhD in military history uh, and all that kind of stuff. So it's, uh, and I enjoy doing this, obviously, and doing all kinds of Canadian military history objects, or sorry, jokes, not objects. Uh, anyway, so today's show is going to be a good one. I'm uh, really excited for this. Uh, I've been on his channel four times now, something like that. Uh, anyway, uh, Paul Woodich from World War II TV. Uh, if you don't know it, check it out. I'm sure most of you watching do right now live do know that. It's probably why you're here in the first place. Uh, but uh, those watching in the future, if you haven't, uh, check it out. So much great stuff on there, which I'm sure we'll get to. But uh, so without further ado, we will uh, we'll get moving. Hello, and you're using my without further ado. I, I, <laughs> I did not do that on purpose. I just went with it. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's mine. You can't have mine. <laughs> uh, yeah. So like I said, thanks for coming on. Uh, I really appreciate it. First time on my channel. Like I said, I think it's four times. I can't remember. I think um, so. Sounds about right. Yeah. Something like that. And over, well, it was a while ago now, over two uh, two years ago now, doing uh, something on Hong Kong. It was quite a while ago or a year ago. Uh, I can't yeah, that was two November 2020, I think. Um, uh, yeah, that was. That was uh, two years yeah. ago. Was yeah, it? that was cool. That was yeah, a good must, anyway, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and anyway, well, yeah, you're you've come a long way since then. Uh, your channel and everything, um, it's uh, it's a good one. Like I said, maybe we'll get to that later. But uh, and what I like to do on mine, I, I don't know if you've seen any of my live streams recently, is ask people usually if the topic or whatever we're, we're talking about their book or whatever, how they got here. And I know you've talked about how you've got to this point a number of times in bits and pieces. But I was just wondering if I can ask you like. How does one end up doing Normandy battlefield guiding and then the jump to YouTube and the great stuff you're doing now? I just, if we could kind of nail some of those details down, well, if you're willing to share, that'd be awesome. Sure. The first thing is it wasn't planned. Every every step <laughs> has been kind of accidental, really. Um, long story short, left school, didn't know, had a bit of issues at school. I had a high IQ apparently, and did, but didn't fit in with secondary school, blah, 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 left school got a job and began to learn um, old fashioned letterpress typesetting mm. and the, the, that, that tray book binding, which I thought was really cool. But then desktop publishing happened like two years later and I suddenly had skills that were just not needed. <laughs> yeah. um, and the business I was in changed to selling stationery, which I wasn't really interested in. And, but I kept at it for sort of 12, 15 years or something, but in the side, mm. at the, I did other stuff. I did, I did voluntary work in museums because I was always interested in World War II. That's kind of come, goes with the territory. And and I did bits and pieces of voluntary work with um, organizing 1940s reenactments and living history events, started getting into providing reenactors for TV shows, things like that, and, and military equipment and vehicles and did a bit of work as a film extra. Then I started taking tours uh, of friends across because I was the one who planned you know, the itineraries did some yeah. little bit of First World War stuff, mostly Second World War stuff. And then when I gave up, finally decided I wanted to give up working in a stationery shop and do something else. Kind of it, it came to the point. Uh, my, my wife at the time, who passed away a few years ago, was French. And we decided to move to her country, France, and I would become a mm -hmm. do something in Normandy. And I didn't know what it was going to be, but it was like early 30s. Hey, let's just try something new. came here and then kind of fell into guiding accidentally. Um, ended up with a business where I had at the peak, I think six or seven employees with vans wow. going out sort of daily. Uh, and then all my guides have gone on to success as independent guys. Cause that's what happens. It's like a lower league football club. Everybody, <laughs> you get a player and then yeah. they become good and they go on for someone else. And, and I thought this, I can't keep bringing people in and then them going out on their own. And I'm all, I'm friends with them all. So I went back to, but I went back to be my own again. Uh, just guiding on my own and then of course COVID began two years ago and it was like boom no work and yeah. I thought how can I keep talking to people how can I keep engaging and talking about history I built up years of contact with some authors and historians and tour guides and right. and and that's where I am so it was all every every sort of stage was was accidental in a sense and, and I always feel an utter fraud because unlike yourself who can say that you've got a PhD in history I don't I haven't anything at all except I've been doing it a long time um um so yeah it's that that's how I got into it yeah and I mean it's it's great I don't even remember I just 
how I found your channel. I think I found it. Well, I found it through Twitter. I don't remember how, but I think I just stumbled on it one day, probably talking about who knows what and everything. And then you invited me on to do that Hong Kong show, which yep. uh, obviously I really enjoyed because I decided to do not quite what you do, obviously, but something similar. And it's kind of how we are. So that, that's great. I love to hear the details uh, behind how you got there. And just you're not a fraud in the slightest sense of that word. That makes no sense. You know way more than some people I know who've done the traditional education path and have no idea the stuff that you do. So well, that's very kind. But it's it's yeah. I mean, what I I still feel a fraud. And my my, my partner today, Mag, would say, you know, I've got in me some innate desire to kind of prove myself because in my late teens I didn't maybe push myself in the way I should have done and I did something different that what I'm doing is what out of some needs to be not loved but kind of recognize that this guy does kind of know a bit about what he's talking about um well I mean this is my own experience but the imposter syndrome hits everybody I mean I I, I don't know I like I, I well I have the finally have the diploma in a frame or somewhere behind me <laughs> but i still it still feels not real to me right that that's how where i am so it's it's just it's an interesting thing i guess everybody shares but anyway i don't want to talk about the sad stuff anyway so <laughs> things that are insecurities uh but what i what i did want to talk about and kind of following your your, your path and experience is the normandy battlefields the canadian ones specifically uh and i know because you've you've talked about this in the past on your show and in different ways on Twitter, social media is yeah, the beaches need to be seen and understood and that's great. Um, but that's not it. And I was wondering if you could talk about the Canadian battlefield specifically, what are maybe your, you know, the ones that are like the must visits or the must understand ones, uh, anything that you think along those lines, uh, it would be great to hear just because I know a lot of it is not fully understood or very well at all by many, many yeah. people. Sure. Well, I mean, there, there'll be a few positives and a couple of negatives. And Mag said to me before, go, make sure you're positive about everything because I can be a bit <laughs> more lazy and grumpy at the age I am now. But <laughs> first thing is, is that of the 50, 60, 70 guides I know who live in Normandy and they are French, British, there's a Russian or two, there's Belgians, there's Dutch. Mm -hmm. You ask most of them what their favorite sector is to, to guide in. And for most of them, it is the Canadian sector. Um, which probably would surprise a lot of people. It would. Um, I, I'm still shocked. I've heard you say that before. Yeah. I'm still surprised. Well, they, they, I mean, the couple of reasons behind it are, is one is you're not doing the same thing all the time as much because there's a lot of, a lot of our clients who come here, they want to see the American beaches. That is, that's the, still the draw, even British people and Amer and Canadian people, because yep. it's the Emperor Art Run, it's Band of Brothers, it's the video games, Call of Duty. It's just, you know, you search D-Day tourism, Normandy, Google, the images are going to come up, American Cemetery, Omaha Beach, San Marigliese, John Steele, Paratrooper, that kind of thing. Um, so if you're in the Canadian sector, you're going to be doing that less than you're spending time in the American sector. So there's that sense of, a few. I've got to go to the Canadian sector after a week of going <laughs> to San yeah. Marigliese. But the other thing we love about it is the very simple nature of of one army landing in one place, going in one direction. Right. You know, if you if you're a Canadian coming to Normandy or anybody else coming who wants to understand the Canadian experience, you can kind of do it in a day. Give yourself yeah. two days, you can do it really quite well. Give yourself three days, oh, and you 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 can cover it. You know, if, oh, yeah. if you don't get side tracked into kind of British and American stuff. Three days in the Canadian sector, you can literally go from landing to conclusion. Mm -hmm. And 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 it's pretty much, you know, take a bit of string, pin it in at Juno and go south. That's the Canadian experience. Yeah, yeah. Just, on an, oh, sorry, just on an angle a little bit. <laughs> and angle it a bit, yeah. <laughs> Whereas, of course, if you're doing the American sector, you've kind of got to do 7th Corps going up to Utah, then you've got to do 5th Corps going to... Uh, uh, um, yeah. Uh, uh, San Lo, and then you've got paratroopers and the British, you've got all the kind of the Gold Beach stuff, then you've got the over near the British Airborne and the Goodwood stuff over there, then you've got so, you know, you always feel with the British or American story that you're ne no matter how much time people have, you're never going to get the end of it. But the Canadi Canadian story, you know, Kappa divisions, then you attach the Polish armoured and stuff to it, you know, as I said, three days if you know what you're doing, you don't waste time and you've got a good books with you, three days, you can kind of say, I've done Normandy from a Canadian point of view. Now, people right. like Mike Bechtold and others would say, no, no, you need longer. Than yeah, of course, you can go well, to greater yeah, levels yeah. of detail. 
Yeah. But, uh, sorry, I was going to say, yeah, of course you yeah. like, of course that's well, what it is. And I've been on a uh, battlefield well with, uh, with Dave was watching and Mark Milner, which was an amazing experience. And we were there for, I don't even know, seven days in just Normandy itself. So we did a lot. We did the American beaches, obviously. We went to Gold and Sword, uh, but the focus is obviously Juno and, and South. And I don't know, to me, because that was my first experience, like to me, that's just what you do. Yeah. You know, you don't just do the beaches, but I get why people don't. A, it's not really accessible for a lot of people because they don't have time or they don't think about it or they don't have the funds for a private tour, which is, it is what it is. But to say that, you know, there's all this stuff to, well, to the South, <laughs> I almost did it again, straight line, is is amazing to me and, and, and the stories and everything. And it, it's a great thing. So we actually had a question. I don't want to, I just don't want to forget it. It's kind of outside, but uh, sorry, where'd it go? We're having lots of good chat already. So that's good. yeah. Uh, well, here it is. Um, so, which um, non-beach, non-airborne British British there? battlefield? Yes, Hill One One Two, I suppose. If you if you had to pick one, um, yeah, um, yeah, Hill One One Two. I'm guessing it, I'm saying is going to be the most important one. But you could also add Mont Pinson. Um, it, it would be important as well. You could you could include Con. I mean, depends what you. Right. Where you count what is con in terms of about, do you do it operation by operation? Do you talk, but I think Hill One One Two, which is still part of con, really in the sense that it is the con campaign. So yeah, it is sort of yeah, depending on how sort you of. define your boundaries. But. Yeah, well that one's a mess, and I didn't forgot any Twitter fights about that one. I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah, because <laughs> there's all kinds of these. Uh, uh, all these things about what fits, what doesn't fit, what's correct. I mean, that's another thing that I think I like, and I've learned from your channel and, and all this different stuff and, and a question I think about, and it might be interesting to hear your thoughts, um, especially like you just mentioned about the Canadian sector and why it's people's favorites is this idea of what these divisions even mean, right? Because the, yeah. the boundary shifted at points as well, right? And cores are moving uh, between, and it, it's just really an interesting thing to think about. Is that something that you came across more so as a, as a tour guide, like people with the national focus? Was that something? Was there people who are like, I want all the highlights, pick what? you think is best or what did you come across of course, well of course, of course yeah the, the the tendency is to to people to view things through a nationalistic lens <laughs> and for the guides to offer to the customers uh a, a a a tour that fits their nationalistic lens and i have over the years toyed with the idea of trying to do theme tours so instead of saying okay. sword beach or gold beach we say i mean like um first engagements against the panzers or mm. let's build that beachhead. But the problem is if you've got a day, if you're trying to do multiple sectors, it's a lot of distance. So I mm. thought, well, could you perhaps include maybe some of the 12th SS Canadian battles in land of Juno and then hop across and do perhaps bloody Gulch, can I, uh, okay. first airborne 17th SS and then move into, you know, some of the stuff, Tilly Cercel, Villa Bocas. When you look at it, you realize that's a lot of driving in a day. Um, yeah, and the themes would kind of connect very well, or, or you know, or but it's so I never really pursued those ideas because of the distance mm. involved. If you could just kind of, you know, use a magic button and transport yourself to different places, I would never do tours nationally. I would definitely go for themes. Well, it, well, that's something I know. Something I want to ask you because you live there, like right, you're in Bayou, so that's that's amazing spot. I think that's like because when I went, that's where we stayed, just outside Bayou. I mean, literally, it was walking distance, which was also cool. But that's a good spot because it's middle-ish. Yeah. Because you're going to get pretty much. Uh, but it, also, why I was thinking about this, because my, my fiancé started watching this show. Or maybe you've heard about these kinds of things where predominantly Brits, again, not insulting anyone, come to France and do up an old chateau. She started watching one of those. And they're in Normandy. And anytime they talk about going anywhere, it takes forever because of the roads is that i don't really because i don't i was guess i was so excited about the trip i don't really remember but is that part of the the issue of why it's so difficult to get around or is it just literally the size of the place just size of the place really i mean i think that's a, that one of the misconceptions is your average person whether they're british american canadian is they look at that kind of little top of a page illustration and in a you know james holland peter caddick adams you know kind of book of normandy and they see the beaches they think oh we could just go along those and they don't realize it's yeah you know, 55 miles up to 70 miles, depending on where you count, whether you count every wiggle of every road. And, you know, and if you've done, for example, the the, the Sword Beach, Juno Beach area uh, in, yeah. the, in the summer, 
it's a very stop-start drive. It may only be five miles you're driving, but you're stopping at the white line every few hundred yards, and there's a camper van moving out in front of you, and you, and, you know you can spend a long time going along there. Which brings up the point I wanted to make about the negativity about about people visiting the beaches. Is and I've been saying right. this for quite a while. Is they re, they re, they visit them in the wrong way? That they they go okay. they go across when they should be going down. Right. So the Brits typically get off the ferry in in Caen. And then they say, oh, let's go and see the D-Day site. So they, they drive along the coast. So they drive Sword Beach, Juno Beach, Gold Beach, and they get to Aramont perhaps by the end of the day, and they look at the harbours. And and along the way, they've if they stop at every single monument, you're going to be doing it for hours and hours. If you stop at occasional monuments, it's a few hours. But you're you're not going the direction the armies went. You're going, you're going, you're you're doing the first film of a trilogy several times in a row as opposed opposed <laughs> yeah. to completing the trilogy and one of the things i found having led how many thousand tours and managed them with with my staff over the years is that people feel the need to tick off whether they're from whatever nation all those june the sixth sites they've heard about and they don't mm -hmm. want to miss one out for the benefit of take of going somewhere in land that they haven't heard of and that's the that's the kind of chicken and egg situation is. Right. You say to someone, if they're American, for example, you could say, well, why don't we follow, um, look at the um, the Seventh Corps on Utah Beach and we'll follow not only the landings there, but the airborne stuff, but we'll kind of head up towards Cherbourg because that's what they're doing. They go, but we, right. we wanted to see Omaha. Of course you do. So <laughs> we've only got the one day. So you end up compromising mm -hmm. between the two sectors, which means you're never completing the story. Uh, and so... The, the, the Canadians do the same thing. They would they would oh, get yeah. off the boat and, and they were, or, or the train or whatever, and they go along. And as much as it's fascinating, as you know, to go to Santo Ban Sur Mer, Bernier Sur Mer, Corsel yeah. Sur Mer, Gray Sur Mer, and you tell all those stories of different units and the you know the Nova Scotias and the Brunswicks and the Reginas and the Winnipegs and the th after a while though you are repeating the same story. Right. Just so you're, you're you're not, and that's not to be disrespectful to the no. another group of men who died on another no. beach. You're you're presenting the same obstacles literally and figuratively. Literally. Whereas if you can start someone saying, "Look, what we're going to do is we're going to follow a seventh brigade uh, over a day or two days," and so think about, right. are we going to get to see? Well, no, you're not going to see where the eighth brigade. But what we're going to do is we're going to do a complete yeah. seventh brigade tour. Yeah. But then you start having to mention places they haven't heard of, like Puto en Bessin or Brett Vallograyers, or and they go, "I have not heard of those places." But you've seen these photos, and you hold up the pictures of, "Oh, I've, I know that photo." Yeah. Yeah. So it's about about eventually, the, the 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 tourists will have to kind of learn to trust the tour guides, and the tour guides will right. have to learn to trust that. The the, the 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 tourists will want to kind of take their advice and and do this more progressional tour but the the, the negative part of me says i don't think it's going to change i think mm. the, the conventional way of seeing the beaches is going to pretty much stick mm. unless enough tour guides and people start saying we need to change how we're doing this uh, but right. that, that's where i'm feeling i'm being all negative again so I'm trying to <laughs> that's smile not negative more. It's not negative at all. I mean, it's 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 a it's it's. I mean, I agree, and I've seen it. I've only been there once myself, but I mean, there's a couple of questions I want to ask in a bit. But uh, we'll have a we have a question. I think it's. Uh, I want to make sure we get it right because Philip's a good supporter of both yep. channels. So uh, I think I, again, we might have missed because there's a bit of delay right with the questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I guess a certain knowledge, but I guess we kind of touched. You touched on that with the Saving Private Ryan Band of Brothers. I, I think that's. Part of it is that's what people know. And I think you mentioned, I can't remember what show, but the video games now are getting mm -hmm. mentioned more and more. It's particularly as people well younger than me, uh, are, that's how they learn. They don't learn through movies anymore. They learn through video games, which is a focus that sometimes there's Canadians in it, but those games are older. I think to me, it's just interesting that it's there's these different ways, but they still seem to end up in the same place. Which is... Yeah, but maybe the video games. Because, I mean, I haven't played a video game for a long time, but maybe they have that sense of going through level one, level two, level three. So right. you aren't repeating the beach assault. The beach assault is the first level, and then you do find yourself batting against after whatever level it is. Panzers in a town in land. Um, right. I mean, the other the other thing about Normandy that that has come up on my channel, talked about, is that Normandy in different 
in a different way to someone like the Ardennes or the Italian battlefields or market garden draws people who are doing it because it's the thing, one of the things you do when you're in France. So you, and I don't mean okay. this in any negative way, but you go to Venice, you see the gondolas, you go to yeah. Leaning Tower Pisa, you do Stratford upon Avon in England and do a bit of Shakespeare. And if you're in Normandy, you do the beaches. It's just a, something you would, you would expect to do. So these are people who aren't necessarily interested in World War II. They're not history mm. buffs. They're right. trying to get, in a sense, the, the perfect travel experience. And they will happily listen to you during the day and they will pay their respects at whichever nationality they're from, cemetery there, but they're not going to go off straight away memorizing the 50 book book list you gave them. And you yeah. really want to know about this one. You want to read this 700 page book by, yeah. th then that's, they're not there for that reason. Um, so right. that's something that that's a bit unique to normal. Though I get the, I guess the first world war has a little bit of that. The Eep area would have a bit of that. It does. Yeah. I think it does. Um, um, I mean, but that's but, but the Ardennes, for example, my friends who are guides in the Ardennes, People go there generally because they've got a, fellow, a, a mm -hmm. relative who fought there or they've got a deep interest because they served in the 29th Division when they were in and they want to see or the 28th Division, what it would be. But normally, a lot of people, it's just it's it's part of what they're right. not going to be interested necessarily in doing the inland stuff. They want to see those main kind of things that they've heard about and identify with and can compare to their... You know, the, the paratroop on the church in Sam Wrigley's, the 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 the, the, sta the statue in, to, to Dick Winter's leadership behind Utah Beach, those recognizable, oh, I know that from the TV show things. So, um, yeah. Well, I think that's a good point here then from from Sheldrick is, yeah, <laughs> tapestry. And yes, because that's what's known, right? For if you don't yeah. know, you'll know D-Day. Most people know D-Day, but they'll have heard of well, tapestry, which I've seen, it is impressive, but it's not why I was there. Uh, but uh, anyway, I just think that's a that's a good way of putting it. And yeah. we touched on that. And, and the other thing about the beaches yeah. is the beaches yeah. are set up to have things to see at them. I mean, they they mm -hmm. have generally right. something more visual there. There's let's take um, Bernier Sommer right in the middle of Juno Beach. There's Canada House, which most Canadians would recognize from the photos. They can see the actual beach, and everyone can can, can comprehend the running ashore up a beach and going that kind of makes sense there you've got monuments left right and center that you can see mm -hmm. down the coast to the juno center at Corsell. whereas if you go to a town for example like bretville or Gaillers, that i mentioned earlier I, you know i did a show on my channel with mike bechtold and one with uh, mark yeah. milner where we covered those kind of events it is just a french town now mm -hmm. If you can point out, and you've done, you've done, you've you've done shows about that. If you can point out, here's where the Panther tank was knocked out. Here's where the guy who earned the, the uh, yeah. military medal was with his pee up there. That's great, but you then need a guide or a very good guidebook to bring that alive. Yes. So again, you said earlier the point about not everyone can afford a private tour. Not everyone can bother. I mean, I went out yesterday with Mag. Went to Lizier for the day, and it was really the idea of having a curry that kind of tempted me. But <laughs> if I had thought about it, I would have taken with me um, where to find. There were three German fighter races buried at a cemetery mm. just outside Lizier, right. and I didn't take the, the details of the graves. And I couldn't, I, ha I couldn't have on my phone that I, I didn't have my glasses on, so I can't read my phone. But I couldn't have their names open and use find a grave to go and. So I, even me as a tour guide failed to prepare for a mm -hmm. trip. You know. Yeah. So no, I get that. Yeah. Yep. So if you're going to go to Brett Vologas or Puto en Bessin or um, any one of those inland bases or near Carpique Airport, Operation mm -hmm. Windsor, whatever it would be, you'd need to have done your prep in advance or have someone say, imagine seeing two squadrons of tanks coming up over that horizon there. Imagine there's an army, an artillery unit of however many 5.5 inch guns sitting over there and coming towards you are, you know, two German armor divisions, that kind of thing. You're going to need the skill of a guy to bring that alive. Whereas, as I said, the D-Day beaches are to crazy, some yeah. extent self, self, um, self-guiding. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a good way to put it. I think. Yeah, I think that's a really good way. Yeah. Sorry, a, a question similar. I think you covered it a little bit, but maybe we can look at it in a in a different way. Again, the the negative. I don't want to do it's not in a negative way. We're trying to understand it better. Is about preconceived notions. Um, yeah, is oh, that definitely. something you come across frequently? Not frequently? Oh yeah, or? no, absolutely. Yeah, it, it's it's, and this is where um, guiding and teaching history and writing about history 
they're three separate circles in the Venn diagram. There's an overlap where mm -hmm. all three overlap in the middle. They're very different things in that people who are coming as part of their vacation, maybe with their family, their other half, their kids, their friends, who, who within that group, there are people with less or more interest in the subject. Mm -hmm. You've got to keep them happy. You've got to keep everybody entertained as well. And, and taking right. someone somewhere where they can kind of, yes, I knew that, is everyone feels good about that and they can kind of show oh, off okay. the members of their group who yes i, I read about because i've read that but i've read that in a book i saw a documentary about it. but if you're taking them somewhere in land that's less familiar to them they've got to concentrate a bit more on what you're saying and they've got to kind of you know fill in a bit of the gaps on their own and perhaps they don't want that on a day out so yeah and this is what gary makes a good point it's the exact same thing it's uh show off in a way or make yourself like you just said feel better or show off and that you know something about where you are instead of you know trying to learn about it yeah. um and well this kind of is an interesting question i don't know if i'm gonna word it correctly is there places that you when you were you know exclusively focusing on touring would say don't go or wouldn't take people no no i mean no. that i'd often you know, reinforcing what I just said. I, well, well, I did happen to. I did a did a Canadian tour just before Christmas. Just guy traveling on his own. Well, he wasn't traveling. His wife was in Paris. And just came out for the day with me. Big mm -hmm. history buff, um, a, a military serving helicopter pilot, and we did an intensive day. Keep still guiding when it was dark. Wow. And he had another day the next day when he wasn't using me. And he said, "Where where shall I go?" And I said, "Well." There's where we should go if you were still with me, and there's where you should go <laughs> okay. now you're on your own. Right. And there's a lot of the places I would I would take him to are not places I would send him to because again, right. it's if you don't know the story, it's a field, it's a street, it's a it's a view from a church towards more fields. And in this case, he knew a lot of stuff, but again, he didn't have his books with him, didn't have his. Right. I mean, there's a certain amount you can put up on your phone and stuff, but so I, no, I I. I in many ways, I would enjoy taking people to places, whatever nationality they're from, where there isn't anything to see, because then mm. it's a test of your ability to convey a picture through through words and a couple of maps you hold up. That's right. It, it's you know, I know you know you teach and David O'Keefe and others teach, you know that, that they sometimes envy the fact that we're out in a battlefield and if you know you're doing it in a classroom with a. Yeah. You know, a, 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 the, 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 the strip lights kind of buzzing and yeah, you're thinking about lunch the same, and the yeah. uncomfortable chairs, listening to you, go, you know, moving on a PowerPoint. Yes, I'm actually at a battlefield mm -hmm. where this shit happened, you know. Yep. But at the same time, you've still got to make it come alive a site that, you know, because you're saying it's so behind the, the supermarket to the left there where that lady's <laughs> yeah. walking a dog and the, right. the dog's having a shit there. That's where the <laughs> panther tank was. So, you, yeah. it, you know, it can be... And it's cold, perhaps, or it's raining. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, no, I, I've taken, I've, I've stood for a long time in some very obscure places mm. where the interest is there because of a family connection or you're following a particular unit. So, no, no, I mean, yeah, I mean, I always find with the Canadian stories of the rabbit hole of talking about, you know, the twelfth SS and yeah. some of the, the nastier things that happened is that, yeah, I, I always wonder when I should shut up when I'm in somewhere like mm. the garden at the Abbey Darden, you know, right. I'm thinking they should know this information. I would like them to know the information that's in my head on top of my tongue, but maybe now, maybe I should wait till we've left the garden. Right. How much time do I leave it before I speak again? That's something that, you know, we're talking about feeling as a fraud, as an academic, you, you've, after years of being a tour guide, you still sometimes don't know when, when to shut up and when to, when right. to not, when to say more. Right. And I think that's, that's, a, that's an issue for everybody. I mean, there's, and I was thinking about that in a, in a different way is not everybody, something like the yeah, Abbey, most people actually don't know what that is. Um, I mean, they, they have no clue what that means. I mean, I don't like talking about it too much, but I, I always bring it up. So maybe I do a little bit, but the Valor and the Horror taught, talked about yeah. this. And that was huge in the early 90s. So I think yeah. a lot of people learned it from that. But like people like say my age probably have no idea what any of that means unless they've done something connected to it. So that's maybe kind of, and maybe that's a good way of putting it is you have to guide literally almost to, you know, how to not necessarily think about it, but what to think about and how to go about thinking about these things. Because that obviously the, the Abbey comes up for me as a Canadian and having been there and 
knowing the story is the first thing that kind of pops into my mind about, because I've heard other people say like, they'll take people there, even if they didn't ask, uh, if they give them mm. some sort of leeway, you know, they like take us to, you know, where you think are important or, you know, something like that, where they have some free time or whatever it happens to be. And, and they make that a point to take them there. So I guess maybe that's where my question was coming from is this kind of um, way of thinking about, you know, how to go about, I don't know, teaching, guiding about it, because I think it's, it's a sensitive mm -hmm. topic and it's it's difficult because there's other sites like that as well, right? It's not just, it's just not there. It's not just the Abbey Arden, but there's other places in Normandy and other battlefields as well. I mean, atrocities are happening on every battlefield. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. It, it's it's just something I think is, is an interesting thing to think about in a different way. And I think you do a good job of bringing that up. Uh, so just to go... It's a bit of a sidestep here. It's an interesting question. Actually, I have no idea how any of this works. Um, is certification process for guiding and how any of that works? I literally have no um, idea. Well, there's yes and no. Um, it, to be okay. a, a um, guide conferencier, which is the, the French um, profession of being a, a professional guide, which you can either go and do a training course or it's actually an educational, like a degree course. Mm. Uh, and, and, and you get a badge, you get a badge and that enables you to guide in places that are listed as monuments. So such as the Mont Saint-Michel mm. or, or some of the abbeys, um, the v palace of Versailles, uh, and things like that. And right. of the guides who do battlefield touring, I don't know the percentage, probably half have that qualification and half don't. I don't know. People say, oh, no, you're way off on that. I don't know. I don't have the data on that. <laughs> right. um, and that that is one avenue to be becoming a tour guide. Um, but it it's not it's a generalist qualification. It's a good qualification. It's a very good grounding. Okay. But you learn about, you know, Roman history, medieval buildings, William the Conqueror, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it isn't. A it isn't necessarily a qualification about how to be a guide and deal with people. It's to, it's more of an educational. Mm. You have the, you have the knowledge to be able to present this information. Um, if you're guiding on the battlefields, you don't need any of these qualifications. Um, I haven't got any such qualifications. To stand on Omaha Beach, for example, you don't need any qualification. Uh, right. Um, so. When the, when the Normandy Battlefield Tour Guide Association started seven or eight years ago, I was the vice president for a while. My mag, my other half, is the, currently the president. One of the, and the first ideas we had is is in, in instigating some kind of qualification for a battlefield World War II guiding qualification. Right. And it never got very far because we couldn't agree on what that qualification would cover and we couldn't agree on how it would be monitored how who would teach who how do you judge right. someone else's knowledge you know in that some of it as you know is opinions you know yeah. you know yeah. general yeah. simmons for example and it's not like you can learn that he <laughs> he is a he is a commander of a force but whether he's any good yeah. or not is down to interpretation and mm -hmm. you could learn all the details about him as a commander but get his influence on the battlefield wrong from some right. people's points of view so in the end that right. never happened yeah. Um, so, um, but I can see, I can see why that's, that's difficult because like you just said, it's the interpretations, it's the, well, the fog of battle, literally it's a cliche, but it's true. I mean, especially because yeah, you bring up Simmons and that just, my mind goes to tractable. Right. So and, yeah. and all those so, battlefields and it was literally, you couldn't see, like it was literally, you couldn't see anything. And so it's just, it's an interesting part to think about. Uh, another question I, I, I wanted to ask, and it might, I hopefully it doesn't upset anybody, but I, it's just something I know you've been talking about, and you might have, and you you have a background in this a little bit, not a little bit, a lot. Is well, I guess it's like a two part. The reenacting is quite popular in Normandy. Um, it's pretty much everywhere, um, and certain sites. Again, I don't. I've only been there once, but I've learned quite a bit since then, and then people talking to people online. The places like Pegasus Bridge. I think you know come where I'm going with this. <laughs> you know, the harbor, the Mulberry Harbor. It to me, it, it seems like it takes on a different atmosphere at certain places because of reenacting. And I was just wondering if if you have any opinions on if that's a good thing, bad thing, both. I mean, it's it, to Absolutely, me, I can yeah. see some difficulty. Like maybe I should explain a little bit because, as you know, I have a relative who was killed in Normandy uh, on Juno Beach, uh, and we were at, at Benny the cemetery. And there was a reenactor there with his regiment. He was wearing the uniform of his regiment. 
And it kind of rubbed me the wrong way, maybe because I was, you know, upset from having seen his grave for the first time ever uh, mm-hmm. and just what that meant. Um, but now I rethink about it. Maybe I should have talked to him and asked him why. Yeah. So I just wondering, because I've heard all different kinds of opinions and maybe it's not necessarily your opinion, but opinions you've heard of people about the reenacting, because, you know, vets too, or before the most of them passed away, if their opinion of this kind of thing, maybe that's a better way to go about it. Well, I mean, again, like anyway, I, I, I used to do, I was a reenactor for a long right. time. And, and yep. the, the, the couple of units I did reenactment with the Royal Norfolk Regiment. So we did third division in right. Normandy and we did, I did first Airborne Reconnaissance Squadron at Arnhem. And in both cases, the, the groups that I was involved with were affiliated with the Veterans Association. So we would parade okay. uh, the first Edwin Reconnaissance Squadron have their annual. They don't anymore because I think they pretty much all passed away bar about one or two at Ruskington up in Lincolnshire. And we would we would parade their standard. We would have the green and yellow Reconnaissance Corps squad, flag uh, standard. We'd be there in battle dress, best battle dress, bald boots. And we would do the honor guard stuff for them at mm-hmm. their request. We initially started right. going, in fact, before I joined, you know, in our sort of suits and ties as associate members. And they started saying, you should, you should bring your Jeeps. Then it's, well, you should mm-hmm. wear your battle dress. Then it's kind of, we, you might as well do the honor guard. And in the end, it kind of, you should, you should join in drinking from the whiskey chalice they passed around. Mm-hmm. And the same thing with the Royal Norfolk. So in those cases, it was endorsed. But there are other units that don't. And, and, in, and I've met individual veterans who don't in any way like reenactment. And they think it's disgraceful and disgusting and inappropriate. And others who think it's brilliant. It's it's the same. I think I made it on a, a show recently at this point about I hate it when people group the veterans in as if yeah. as an entire collective. Right. They have <laughs> one single thought about anything. Uh, you know, six twenty put 20, 20 Winnipeg Rifles veterans in a bar 10 years after war. You'd have twenty different versions about oh, yeah. commanders, battles, reasons for volunteering, who was shit, who was good, yep. who enjoyed it, who didn't enjoy it, who voted for which prime minister, who vo- that's yep. life. Um, yeah, well, that's sorry. This is a bit of an aside, but it makes me think of this uh, when I was defending my PhD. Not trying off, I just think it's exactly what you said. My supervisor was like, "You get five historians in the room, you're going to get six different opinions." <laughs> and that's yeah. just stuck with me ever since because it's true. It's 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 no matter what. I mean, history is particularly, um, you know, um, prone I mean, to these things. Of I'm watching look in the comments, things. and people are saying, "Sorry to interrupt you." People, you know, yeah, there's good ahead. reenactment, there's bad reenactment, and that's absolutely the right. case. The thing is, is that reenactment is 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 in your face you can't if someone turns up in a half track right. it's there it's there it's very it, it's it's you i kind of make the argument that yes there's bad reenactment there are bad books written about juno beach there are bad mm-hmm. tour guides who tell information badly but a bad mm-hmm. tour guide is only going to kind of be seen or heard by the group his te- or he or her is talking to mm-hmm. but a but a, a person turning up as a reenactor and bombing up and down the the, the promenade in Corsal in a in a in a Queensland Rifles Academy jeep with Bren guns bristling is mm-hmm. going to be seen by a hell of a lot more people than a tour guide saying that it was actually I don't know Polish paratroopers who landed on J- Juno beach so the, the potential right, right, right. the potential to offend of a reenactment group is way larger in in some ways than the potential of a bad history book to offend people. But I don't think if people who don't like reenactors don't like bad reenactors, they should also call out bad historians and bad tour guides mm. and bad movies as well, because it's the same. Right. It, there's good and bad everything. So I've had some really powerful moments since living in Normandy where I've seen reenactors, living historians add huge amounts to events. And I've gone, wow, that was an amazing addition to that event there and connections made between right. veterans, reenactors, historians, that the, the synergy between all those different ways of acknowledging the war have been f- fantastic. And other moments where I have wished the world would just swallow me up because I've been so <laughs> off the chart, cringe levels of yeah. both cringe offense of, oh my, why are they, do- have they no, yeah. you know, I mean, an example being, the American cemetery at Omaha Beach, they 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 went to the point where they they just banned reen. I think they still have banned reenactors going okay. in, in uniform at all. Oh, now it started that? off yeah. that they said don't take weapons in. Now to me, you shouldn't have to have a fucking sign. <laughs> excuse my language. <laughs> Saying if you're a reenactor, leave your Jeep with your 50 cal in the car park. I mean, I'm laughing about it, but the fact they had to have right. a sign is because idiots would turn up there. Yep. 
walking and the same thing would happen at Benny Summer. I'm not again, I'm not criticizing American right. reenactors. Ever, you know, people I'm sure people have turned up in Canadian battle dress and walked around Benny Summer with a right. Lee Enfield over their shoulder. I'm sure that's happened. Oh, yeah. I, oh, so yeah, like that's a story. Well, yeah, I think that answers that question for Brian there. Uh, is, yeah, yeah. Is, so well, that's part of the, another reason why I think I got upset at the reenactors and kind of had a bad opinion for quite a while is because we got, as soon as we got out of the cemetery, there's two dudes, I don't know who they were, came in a Jeep, loud and as fast as possible, and then jumped out like they were under attack. And we had just done like the official ceremony at Benny. Yeah. And I'm acting like, what is, what are you doing? Are you just showing off? Do you think you're helping? Like, I don't know what's going on. Again, I should have uh, maybe asked just to, you know, kind of learn something. I mean, the, the, the analogy I use, right, is let, let's say that there's a church in your village and this applies whether you're British, Canadian, American, whatever, there's a church. Right. And one day there's a wedding taking place. A few beautiful things. There's a couple getting married. Another day there's a funeral taking place. Another day there's a right. Christian rock group doing a a charity thing to raise money for harvest festival but they're all happening at the same time at the same hour because that's what happens in normandy on june the, around june the 6th is you have right. things happening that are, each of which are legitimate in their own right but they're happening at the same space in the same time so you can absolutely be standing as you were on juno beach as someone who lost a relative there thinking about that Aside, alongside you is a tour group explaining history. Alongside you is a local person walking his dog because that's where he lives and he walks his dog on that bit of beach every morning. And mm -hmm. then you've got a reenactor who's showing off how a Lee Enfield works to a group of interested people. All of those things are, are kind of fine, but they're happening in the same place. So tonally, mm -hmm. it's, it's, you're, 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 as you move your head around, there's all different tones happening at the same time. And that's when I, when I tell when people contact me and they say I'm thinking of coming to my Normandy for my first time ever and I'm coming in the anniversary time I say don't I say yeah right if you've been to Normandy before and kind of had your time to stand by a grave walk around a cemetery do a yeah. museum that then then by all means come back at an anniversary because there's color and sights and sounds and smells that you don't see other time and it's gonna be brilliant you know yeah it but, was. If it it's just, a first visit, it's just a bombardment of oh, yeah, happening to your senses that you're going, it's, I'm offended and proud and angry <laughs> at the same time. And that's colors really everywhere. <laughs> your, your, your brain is just doing all sorts of reactions at the same well, simultaneously. Well, I was gonna say, like, because that's I guess like yeah, tech well, we were because again, we went on a battlefield tour as a student group. We had A done other battlefields before that. We did first uh, for Western Front D app. So we got, you know, what that means. But we were in Normandy, I think, a few days before the sixth and had had seen the beaches and everything before it was a gong show and a Canadian expression. Uh, but then the sixth came and it was just madness. Like I I guess I should have expected that, but I was not I was I was honestly overwhelmed in a little way and a little upset and some of the things I saw and the way some people were, it's not even necessarily reenactors. I'm not even talking about that, but the things I saw in certain places were kind of upsetting, but, and, and it makes sense though, the way you're saying it is, is there's all this going on. It's, it's a place where still people live, which is something people forget. Yeah. And you've talked about this numerous times, about things like bunkers and memorials and all of that and, and, and everything, but that's not it, but it's just, there's so much, happening and there's so much and it means so many different things to so many different people it's just i, I guess the best way is just uh, like you said don't come then <laughs> i can't yeah. think of another way I to mean, say it yeah, I mean, so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna try and tackle reenactment as a as a subject well you know a couple months time on on, on my channel and i right. and i don't think we're gonna draw any firm conclusions and no. i think there'll be lots of toing and froing and the people who don't like it will still don't like it and those that do like it will like it and and that's it but it's it, it it the thing is it exists and i think it's better to kind of tackle it and talk about it and try and work with them and hmm. that's what i try and do as a as a as a former reenactor who's both proud of some of the stuff i did and also embarrassed about the, the brush that it gets tarred with from the bad people i kind of yeah. i would i would now try and engage with people and i wouldn't you know i would say why are you why are you taking that gun in there why are you acting i'm mean, for me if you come to Normandy as a reenactor, get to a certain point in the evening, just take the uniform off and go and have your beers. Don't don't kind right, of have right, your right. beers. But it's about looking yourself in the mirror and saying, you know, and it's the same applies to to to, to us tour guides. So we us tour guides, mm -hmm. for example, um, 
it, it, we might because the people do similar itineraries i would occasionally bump into other tour guides at benny somer canadian right. cemetery when our we give we're both giving our customers their 15 20 30 minutes to walk around there and we would be in the car park having a little chat now if you think we're going to be talking very reverently for those 25 minutes with with about canadian losses in world war ii you'd be very wrong because we're tour, tour guides we were saying city films last night yeah Oh, my customers are idiots today. Whatever it is you'd be talking about. Or, <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, you know, I'm, I'm really, you know, the weather was awful. We're just having a chat. Now, should we be more reverential because mm. we're in the parking lot of a cemetery? Should we adjust our behavior, our conversation? Because it's like surgeons take telling disgusting yeah. jokes while they're cutting yeah. your chest open. You know, that's it's. So we all have, I, as as people who talk about community, World War Two, be it. In, on a channel as we both do educationally you do tour guide we all have these moments of is this appropriate you know am right. i am i am i being a bad person making money out of people's death i've had that thought in my head many times as a tour yep. guide you know yeah. you know paying my rent mortgage gas bill whatever because i've taken people to cemeteries and seen them cry you know, that is that is that a worthy way of making a living hmm. it's uh, yeah, I get exactly what you're saying. I've had many moments myself, not even doing this. I mean, just PhD military history generally. It's it, I think it's part of it. It's 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 a it's yeah. I don't know. It's it's hard to say. There's no obviously. There's going to be no answers, but it's just an interesting thing to think about and in, in doing history, right? And what that even means and everything. Like we had a question. I don't know. Maybe we'll talk about it very briefly. But like the difference between. World War II reenactors and like Napoleonic era, right? Is the distance of time is that? Oh, good definitely. Enough? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, like, that's a different thing, right? But and I, and I completely get that. I mean, when I used to do a little bit of work for English Heritage, who own lots of the chateaus and stately homes and things, and we did Fort Nelson and places like that, Tilbury mm. Fort, um, right. uh, event. One of their policies, they would have multi-period living history events, mm -hmm. um, and I believe they may still do them uh, and one of their rules was and i completely can get this no ss no if you could they would have some german troops there but strictly wehrmacht or, or, or kriegsmarine or something right and yet the romans were allowed there um i mean yeah. <laughs> the yeah. romans did their fair share of butchery and oh, atrocities. Yeah. <laughs> um but as you say it was it was a thousand years ago um so it's no living you're not gonna no one's gonna come my mom was killed by a roman i mean, it's, <laughs> I mean i'm laughing because that's just yeah i mean yeah, i'm not gonna it, get that because um, it, it won't happen yeah yeah i mean I think I, it, some I think curious things have happened to me and you know i mean an old reenactment story for my early days in reenactment is there was and i'm not questioning it the morals behind it and because it, it's a massive great rabbit hole but there was a guy Fred Walker was his name, um, who used to dress as a captain in the 352nd Division, I think it was, in mm. German Infantry Division. Yep. And at one living, uh, living history event, a member of the public went in up to him and said, you should take your hat off because you, you, you have no right to wear that hat. And he said, I didn't have to take my hat off and I surrendered the Allies in 1945 and I'm not taking it off now. Because this guy, his real name was Friedrich Walker and he was in the German army in World War II and was still reenacting. I'm laughing, it's an ironic kind of laugh. Was, he was probably okay. been in his 60s by now, but he was reenacting. Now, open up that as a, as, a, as a potential discussion. But the point is, the guy who <laughs> asked him to take his hat off just stood there like a guppy because he was like... <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know how to process it. He didn't know. He didn't know how to process the response because his brain just went. He just imploded. I remember this, this guy going. <laughs> and he, he, you could, like a blue screen came up. I have. I know. I do not know how. And he just kind of walked off like this. Go, and bought an ice cream. <laughs> but I, you know, yeah. What do you do? I have no idea. I'd be like. Okay. All right. Bye. So, <laughs> you know, what you else know. do you do, right? I mean, that's, but I mean, like you just said, that's a massive rabbit hole, and maybe that can be another thing. Another. I mean, you know, again, reenactment re re then becomes museum. It morphs into museum interpretation. It morphs into yeah. first person living history stuff. And I've done some of that stuff. I went to National Army Museum many, many years ago where I was wearing battle dress and I was cooking up rations, telling people how British yeah. Army made stuff. And I was doing it in first person character. And and in that environment, I think it's perfectly acceptable. And then the other environment, as we talked about, you have idiots running along, you know, in jeeps with their sirens blazing, waving their machine guns in the air with, you know, shoulder holsters and mirrored sunglasses and 
cigars and stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. doing a kind of a Kenny's Heroes version of World War Two, and you know, yeah. it's it's, it, it's reenactment is more than one thing. Living history reenactment is not just one thing. Just as we know that, you know, YouTube channels about World War Two are more than just one thing. There's all variations right. of it, and saying that judging the whole thing as good or bad is is unfair there there's mm -hmm. there, there's at opposite ends of it there's levels of worthiness so yeah i think that's a, well it is something i did want to talk about because i know you've talked about your past and in, in working and or doing reenacting and then the guiding and because you're moving all different parts of the world war ii story here is is that's kind of the opinion i'm at now it's neither good nor bad i don't know but i don't just think it's bad anymore you know what i mean is that's progress i guess for me personally because i just to me it's it's the, like you said it's multi-layered there's different things how do you tell a german vet that he can't be doing that you know, yeah like, what do you do like what what do you do and then well another thing i thought about what you we were talking about this is we did the ceremony at juno beach and there was vets there because this was pre-covid uh but they were still quite old and there was there was a unit from my hometown, actually, as it turned out, uh, the first bazaars who landed at Juno Beach. Uh, they were there in their uniforms. So there's a whole other layer right there. I was just like, this is really weird. Like, I did not expect to see serving members, you know, in uniform talking to vets. Like, to me, that was just another thing, especially after seeing all the reenactors and all these different layers that come together. And, like, that's literally a unit that had landed there. There was no vets from it, but they had been there and there was, and there was Americans there too, which was awesome. Like, again, there's just more than one thing to this. I guess that's maybe a point I'm trying to make is there's not one way to think about these things. Because again, I've seen some things there that like outright pissed me off. Like I was like, I don't get it. I saw SS uniforms in Normandy and I'm like, why? I mean, I don't want to go down that today because you're going to do the reenacting you have a week planned for that, right? So yeah, uh, the, the, it'll make or break me. It'll, <laughs> it'll either see my me carting carting me off to a place for the bewildered, the bewildered <laughs> ex YouTuber, or it'll it'll be really interesting. And I don't I don't know. Yeah. I think people have to go into it like you are going into open minded and 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 trying to take on board some different views because you know the the whether we like it or not, the way we people are going to want to. Uh, understand their past is going to morph from things in glass cabinets and and, right. and books. You know, YouTube is 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 an avenue. Video gaming, all those things there. Um, you know, as we know, we've, I've talked about comics on my show. I've talked about this, that, and the other. It's if we close ourselves off to the ways, the portals through which people will look at the past and say this one is not good. It's going to happen anyway. I mean, that that mm. museums are going to become more theme based there's going to be more right. of a hologrammy type things and more you know moving things and we went to the museum in Lisieux yesterday mag and i and it was all very interesting and there was a teacher doing a presentation some sort of like seven or eight year olds maybe a bit older and i'm sure he was doing very good very good but he was taking him to a room about um the the, the gauls in normandy mm -hmm. and he was showing them a tray of you know little buttons or something and you go they want to see a picture of a guy with a fucking saw. That's what yeah, they, they, they want. They want to see, but they want to. And and it's not this museum was good. It was a free museum. It was very good. And it was a great exhibition about the, re, the the rebuilding of Lisieux after war, which I found very mm. interesting. But you know, kids now, adults now, tension spans have changed. Things have. We need to address and move with the technologies. People will be wanting to look at the the past and. If reenactment or bad history gets people talking about the past and the quest to then find good history, then that's a good thing. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. It's well, that's kind of where I ended up as I am here. I mean, it's I don't know any academics watching here now or after, but uh, to me, the writing's kind of on the wall. I mean, I don't. There's no jobs. There's no way to keep doing it. Uh, I don't see it. So I want to keep doing history, but what does that even mean anymore? I, I don't know. So I'm trying different things and see what sticks, I suppose, is kind of what my thinking was. So I think this is a good way to do it. It's a different way. Uh, like you said, it's uh, it, it, it's a great way to turn bad into good, I guess. Like you said, the bad history leads to good. And that's a, that's a really good way of thinking about it. Um, this is actually something I've thought about, too. It's a good question, actually, from Sheldrake again. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know what you think about that because I've I've thought about this and there's some things coming out. I know um, the Vinvi Foundation is doing not the VR goggle kind of thing, but the augmented reality thing they're working yeah, on. Yeah, I've, I've, I'm aware of various things happening and there have been people already go to places with the with the 360 cameras and taking footage so you can stand in the Ardennes forest or, or wherever it would be. And yeah, it's it's going to be, again, it's it's going to, these things are going to happen and and we move with it or we don't move with it. I mean, I, I'm a small fish in a, in a, in a, in a pond, but I get people contacting me and saying, I'm doing a video game. I'm doing this. And I never just ignore him. I know historians who yep. just ignore that stuff. They just, me too. I, I don't like it. Yep. And I think, well, engage with them at least find out what they're up to it's for the sake of an email i mean maybe there's no money involved maybe there's but but you know find out what they're doing and can you as a historian help them with this even mm. if the idea sounds a bit weird to you we want you know but just kind of engage with it and see where they're going with it and whether there's any way forward for it to be a medium because mm. you know I, I i've realized with my with my channel like you there are people who, when I hold a book up and say, you should get this book, go and buy the book. But there's many who don't, just people, weird people who just don't buy books you know, <laughs> or don't get them from libraries. And yeah. I, I don't mean that if you're watching this and you're someone who doesn't use books, that's fine. It's just I am from a generation <laughs> where I like books. Yeah, um, well, I am too. I mean, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so, but my stepdaughters don't use books as their primary resource for getting information right. they hop online i mean uh, yeah. and so uh, and and they are better because they're younger than me at discerning what is good on the internet mm. and what is bad they 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 right. have a different set of skills um about finding out these things so yeah i mean it, w w all these new things are going to happen so um you know that that that's it um and i i think that as long as we're discussing the past even if we're looking at the negative aspects of discussing the past, it is still discussing the past. Right. Well, I think that's a good way to put it about it. And that's why I think about it is, yeah, there's a lot of bad, but the people would be bad. I don't know. And then there's another possible rabbit hole, but the people that are upset about there's the whole statue thing and the cancel culture. So supposed cancel culture and all of this is to me, that's just seems so black and white and it's, it's not in that sense. And, but it also needs to have interpretation from multiple sources. But again, that's maybe something else, but that's speaking to what you said, right? These historians who just ignore people. And I just, to me, that's crazy. Like, why would you do that? Like, why would you ignore people, A, who are going to have, sorry to say it again, but have more impact than you. Sorry, you know, 30 well, or 10-year I mean, that, 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 historian is not going to get listened to. That, that's the thing. I mean, you know, the, a couple of years ago, to 2019, I had my first invitation to go to James Holland's Chalk Valley History Festival there, which is amazing. And it's like four marquees of lectures starting at mm -hmm. two o'clock till 10 o'clock. And you know, 150 historians and there's outside exhibit and you and there's thousands of people coming in there and watching it there. And I was thinking over 10 years of this event happening with 150 historians speaking over a week, they still haven't reached even 10% of the audience of people who watched Band of Brothers or Seven Bright Ryan or Valor and the Horror, for example. So the TV, films, video games are going to have YouTube. I mean, you know, as you know, as you, you and I, we look at these YouTube channels that are getting gazillions of yeah, views. I know. And you're thinking, God, the reach they're having. And historians would, who are writing books would be delighted with a percent, 1% of the readership of their books that some of these channels are getting. Um, yeah. So, Work with it. Go with it. Keep yeah, it. well, that's that's what I say. You got to kind of kind of go with it here. Um, so, well, I, I want to ask you. It's kind of now going back to the the, the tra sorry the battlefield guiding kind of thing. Is, yeah, sure. Is there a favorite site of yours that you like to go to? I mean, that might be difficult to answer with your experience, but I gotta ask. I mean, the easy answer and a bit of a cop out is whatever I've been reading about recently. So, so <laughs> okay. if I'm going out to go that, and search something. And I've done a little bit of reading the day before and we're going out there. So that, that, I like to have that little level of excitement of revisiting somewhere again, um, you know, with a, with an extra level of, of um, discovering it, you know, especially when I'm with a couple of my mates with Mag and Colin and people like that, we go out and we say, let's go look mm. at the, the DLI doing this. So that, that, that still is, so it doesn't have to be a, 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 the set battlefield. It's just a going out and looking at it with a fresh pair of eyes with a couple right. of other mates and you can discuss theories and, 
I think it would have been this this hedge line, not that hedge line, because look how this contour line, that, that's always great. Yeah. But favor battlefields. I mean, um, I, I I do love from a Canadian point of view, um, the very very air ridge point sixty seven is really cool. Um yeah. and you know, they've done a great job there with the twenty five pound and information panels is and it's a it's a bit it's not hard to find, but you're not gonna go past it by accident. It's not again, right. if you do the drive along the beaches, you'll see every damn monument along there if you keep your eyes trained to the to the to the promenade area, but point two seven, you've got to kind of actively go there and then you drive up, you park then it's yeah. an amazing one to explain oh, yeah. those July battles and you can see the ground there. So that's a kind of favorite Canadian one. Uh, Mortan over mm. towards Avranche for the American 30 division is a, is a place I love going to. Um, it's partly because on the way there, there's a shop that sells English sweets and biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it, are you going there for the battle or the biscuits? It's a bit of both, really. <laughs> there, but there's nothing wrong with you that. Know, one of the things that, that we, we invigorated myself and Colin and Duncan, who's currently overseas working in MAG, is because we weren't working with COVID, you're not going back to the same battlefields again and again, telling the same stories again and again. You, you, right. you, you've nothing to do. So we would go out and relearn or learn for the first time Operation Charmwood, Operation Wind. Let's go and look at um, Malto near Hill 112. Let's go and look at uh, and you know, rediscovering a place that you lived in, but it had become a work environment where you were doing mm. You know, you, yep. even like if you're teaching in a university, you, you you'd park your car in the same place, walk down the same corridor to your room, and and you're not actually seeing the rest of the university. You're just doing your same little yep. leg every day, yep. and 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 that, that's kind of how Normandy became for us. And fish and chips on the way as well, <laughs> Colin is reminding us there. So you know, so it was a great to actually go out and 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 f rediscover our places there. So. um yeah, I have a few favorite battlefields. I, really, it's about connecting. It's the ones that are just beside the ones that people know. Mm. That you so so. For example, when I'm if I'm doing a, an air, British airborne, British or British and Canadian airborne tour, driving from um, um, uh, Varaville, where the first action was, yep. down to the Liminal Crossroads, and then that bit where I stop in in the Bois de Breville by the water tower, and there's a Chateau Saint Com there, and you just show people the view across towards Sword Beach and the Pegasus Bridge. And and you see that moment where they, they understand the ground. That's a really cool thing. So you you know mm. that one little stop there has just brought elements together that they the customers can then visualize that sense of things. And that when you're matching up, it's weird. I'm talking against my. I'm, I'm contradicting myself because I don't. <laughs> I've, I've become a bit of a negative about the overuse of then and now photos on social media. Day after day, people here's this yeah. wall. Here's this wall in the past and. It's yeah. a great tool, but in some cases, it can be a bit sterile and repetitive. But there's, mm -hmm. but, but when you're with someone, I go back to Brett Valorgaers again, and you're with oh. someone there, and they haven't really understood why you've parked them there. And mm -hmm. it's towards the end of the day, and they're still listening to you, but they're now thinking about the meal they're going to have in Bayer. Mm -hmm. And you go, coming down this road with two mm -hmm. panther tanks, and this one was hit here. And then you showed up, see that window there? That's window. And they go, oh, it was right here. And or in, on, in, um, Corsell, um, for example, mm. oh, sorry, Bernie, Bernie, Bernie Semed, yeah. just opposite of the opposite of Macanda House. As you walk down the road that's named after the Raison de la Chaudière, mm -hmm. there are the, 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 the little chinks in the uh, the curbstones where the the, oh, uh, the, yeah, yeah, the, 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 the the Sherman tank tracks went click, 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 and it yeah. just knocked out the and you can see you can show people where a tank, presumably on D, D Day, but maybe a couple of days later graunched its way down the road and, tink tink and knocked out these sections of the curbstones. And you see that moment when the customer is there for a second. Colin, who's watching, who's you know my mate, great guiding mate, when he's in full flow on a beach, his eyes are closed. And I know he's kind of there. He's in his battle dress. With his, and, and his customers are there with him. And that, that that's that. It's not necessarily the place. It's that moment when, and I'm not comparing ourselves to, to rock performers, but that moment when, you know, Bono, Chuck Berry, whoever it is, all the crowd there in harmony with them, Bruce Springsteen is doing mm. it. Yeah, everybody's yeah, yeah. in that moment yeah. is that, you know, the rain can be lashing in on a beach there, but they're still, they're kind of with you in the landing craft mm -hmm. and you manage to paint the story. That's when you love a battlefield, when you and your people are, are, are 
at one with it. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Because I mean, I just saw the Great Dominion's question there. So, uh, he, uh, so yeah, do you bring want to that one it? up. Go ahead if you want to. You don't have to if you don't want to. Um, well, I was thinking about this yesterday actually because oh. that is a big debate, which, yeah. which there are no there are no definitive answers. Yeah. Um, it, it all depends on your parameters and what you call Normandy, what you call mm -hmm. battle, what you call fighting. Yeah. But I, I, I've i always thought my own interpretation is it's the liberation of Paris closes mm. one chapter before another chapter begins. But I completely take on board the argument that it's not until the half, which is still part of Normandy, is right. liberated. That's therefore literally the, the end of the Battle of Normandy because there is no more fighting within the regions we count as Normandy. Right. But the, another legitimate argument is the closing of the Falaise Gap. But I was at the British cemetery at saint Désir yesterday, just near Lisieux, which of all the British cemeteries in Normandy um, is probably with the closest group of dates. Apart from, um, there's four 1914 soldiers there from Chartres who were reburied there. And there's a, some, a lot of RAF air crews in 43, but the rest right. of the date, it's about August the 19th to about August the 31st. So you've two weeks of window. And these are people who died after the closing of the Falaise Gap. Well, not the ones on the 19th, but the ones killed on the 23rd, yeah. 24th, 25th, pushing towards the Seine. So in that cemetery, if G, uh, GD at Great Dominion had asked me, when's the Battle of Norway? I would definitely wouldn't have said the Falaise Gap closing no. there because I would have been standing over the graves right. of men who died a week later. So Right. I mean, my, my opinion changes depending on kind of what mood I'm in and what I'm considering. But yeah, in well, that, my head, the liberation of Paris is kind of if you have a big, thick book that is World War II, that's when the, the library yeah. kind of goes chunk. Yeah, that's when it they, begins yeah. the new episode. The over. Yeah. I mean, that's how I, I mean, I don't have, the, I don't claim to have any definitive answers basically on anything. But for that, I just, I think about it in phases because I guess that's the way I've researched it, thought about it done writing on it like i've looked at like you said like well i've looked at um right on the ground at uh, saint lambert yeah. like i've been there i did some really deep studying for it for project 44 and we did a thing together and i did the writing for it like yeah that to me that feels like like you said the end of a chapter but then me and nathan from the organization got talking about okay why does that develop the way it does and what is going on afterwards right like because mm. they don't move and support as they may have been able to. But then, you know, the race to the Seine, what does that mean? You know, yeah. like, is that part of this? Is that reason enough to not support, you know, closing the smallest part of the gap when it was still open? You know, like, I mean, I'm not claiming to have any answers here, but it's just, I like to think about it, depending, like you just said, depending on context, I suppose, is the best way to put it and how you want to look at it. Um, but yeah, and well, just ask and, and, and he just said, and Dieppe is there normally as well. So you know, it it's yeah. it's making a case and then kind of re giving the reasons for your case. And one of the reasons, one of my favorite historians is Joe Balkowski, the American who writes about Omaha Beach Train Night right. Division, because Joe is very good at explaining in his books his parameters. So he will say, I'm going to define how I interpret casualties on D-Day or whatever by this set of rules. Yep. You can apply a different set of rules if you want, but these are the criteria I am going to decide to determine this. So that's so when someone says, when's the end of the Battle of Normandy? I would say by this set of criteria, I'm going to give you yeah. this answer. But I could also, by a different set of criteria, give you this answer. And again, it's geographically, um, terms of loss, significance, they are different ways of answering that same question. And, and, and even more complicated, in a sense, is when did the Battle of Normandy start? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, 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 uh. <laughs> that again, is, is problematic. A, very, a, very, uh, um, a veteran friend of mine, um, who's long since passed away, was the treasurer of the Norwich and Norfolk branch of the Normandy Veterans Association. Um, and he would joke in the pub about he was a fraudulent member of the Normandy Veterans Association because the criteria then for membership of the Normandy Veterans Association was you had to land in Normandy between June the 6th, 1944, and I believe the cutoff date was September the 30th, 1944. May have been a bit later. Right. The point is he had come in in a Jedburgh team, SAS, June the 4th. So therefore, <laughs> he did not come within the criteria. Oh, so he would say, I, I'm a fraudulent member of the, of the NVA. And you go, yes, you are. But how would it, you, you wouldn't say he wasn't. So 
criteria by yeah are problematic because you're mm-hmm. setting a set of rules that are open to other people interpreting them differently, which brings us to the although you're Canadian channel, the, the, the British monument of Bear Sur Mer, which has decided upon a set of criteria for yeah. its list of names. Yeah. And uh, some people would say they don't like the boundaries they've accepted. And well, no one's ever gonna be happy. You can't make everybody uh, happy. Well, I mean that's the, it's not Second World War, but it's the first world war, right? The men and gate. They just picked an arbitrary date. <laughs> yeah. You gotta pick one. I mean, I get it. You have to, because I mean, just the number alone is shocking. But I mean, it's just sometimes there's other reasons for it. And maybe that's one. I don't know. Well, I'm sorry, I put Colin's uh, comment up there because he's saying the opposite of what we're saying. <laughs> it's just well, he's, he's, a, he's, a contra- yeah. he's a contrary fo- fellow, is Colin. Yes, he, he, would, is. He, he would argue with me because we're friends. But yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> it's it's it this is this is the a, a problem i think jenny with with putting history out by a modern set of things rules right. in that we are in an instant gratification era where we must know the best you know the, what's the best band what's the best album what's your yeah. favorite movie give your 10 best thing life's not like that life is constantly changing and fluxing and you ask me my five favorite albums today mm. it'll be different to my five favorite albums next week and you know th- this idea of giving a definitive version of anything i think is 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 inherently problematic i loved when um frank mcdonough came on my channel talking about his um uh, two but two books about the the, the the rise of the german you know third reich and he was saying mm. i I forget. I'm paraphrasing him. I I fully expect my book to be out of date within ten years, and I hope yeah, right, it's right, out right. of date within five. And to me, yeah. that's fantastic. You know, because more information we share will be come to light. We will look at things from a different point of view. Another historian will unearth things and suggest things from another angle, and we'll go, "Oh, that's interesting." And 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 it's it's never going to be constant. You know, this as you know, you know, the toughest beach, most most casualties. Yeah. Inland, who endless parameters. Yeah, it doesn't end. I mean, that's why I don't like to get involved in it anymore. But in, in the slightest way, because it's to me, it's a, it's an unproductive exercise, and it, it's it's just it's not helpful. Uh, this is an interesting question uh, from Norma, who's also another great supporter of both channels. Is, yeah, yeah. Um, Hello, and Norma. maybe because you you have an interesting experience with yourself living there, but people who've lived there longer than you. But then also Meg's opinion, who is from Normandy, right? You said she's from outside of St. Lowe, right? So born in St. Lowe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so, but she's so, also a tour guide. So <laughs> yeah, no, well, and again, this is where you there's not a range of opinions, you yeah. know. I mean, there's um I, I know one member of Mag's family who who pretty much goes inside and shuts his shutters and stays inside and doesn't go out for those few days around June the sixth because they just hate the the not just the carnival y kind of act, they just hate all mm. of it. Just kind of I just and you know, Mag's family, a lot of them are from San Marcouf, just behind Utah Beach, which which suffered the most right. civilian deaths yep. in La Manche on D Day. So there's different ways of looking at this. And uh, in the touristy places, so such as Sad Marigli's, Aaron Morse, Bayer to some extent. A lot of the businesses, the shops, the restaurants aren't owned by people from Normandy anymore. That they, they people have mm-hmm. moved in there to set up these businesses. Some of the museums are owned by people from outside and the private ones. And mm-hmm. so their views about tourism are very different to those who 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 are there, um, who have been there all their lives. It's you know, you'd ask them. A, a lot of people they give you very different views on that. I mean, it's a it's a necessary thing, and it's important for the economy, and people understand that. Yep. Um so yeah it, it there's no not one answer but it, it what's what is interesting is is that there, there is still some aspect of the local population who would not like things that are kind of you know vis, audio, laser shows commemorating bombardments with visual effects of searchlights and bombers coming yep. over and you know that 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 wouldn't go down with some people, but the sites being opened as an interpretive center, that would be fine. So it, it, it's it's reading the room, knowing the reasons for doing things, and understanding that doing things. Someone said it earlier on the on the sidebar. There, the key word is respect. You know, yeah. if tourism is done in a respectful way, sure. Um, 
But this is an interesting point. Because, <laughs> right, because Canada House is owned technically, it's split in half. Yeah. So I think, I don't know, there you go. There's your answer right there. <laughs> yeah. yeah people, I yeah. mean, there's, there's, there's a place... people in their homes and people who don't want them anywhere near you. And they live there's in a, the There's a building country. in the Falaise Gap that I won't mention by name, but people would know it if they read a bit about the Polish that was owned by a farmer for a long time. And if I'd park outside, he would say, he'd come out and chat and he, and someone else bought it. Um, I guess the farmer died. And this guy has made it completely clear by all the fences around. He doesn't want anyone stopping in his driveway. And part of me thinks, well, why the hell did you buy a house <laughs> that's in photos? You know, yeah. someone during the purchase process must have pointed out to you, you do know this house was, I'm not going to say what it is, because I don't want to offend anybody, but why did you buy it then? You know, yeah. if, if, if you... If you buy a house on the street in Stratford upon Avon, where everyone walks up and down between the mm. theatres, and the, then don't right. expect you know, expect people to look through your window, yeah. and that's you know, uh, so yeah, I get what you're saying. It's not not just a Normandy thing. I think it's yeah, that, that's it. tourism generally. I think really, I think so, it's just um, a tourism thing. yeah. So we've got if that's all right. If you still want to keep chatting, that would I'm, be... I'm fine. Yeah, nothing else to do. But, uh, yeah, me either. Uh, well, that's a lie. But uh, oh, we got something else. Here. Sorry, there was a good question I wanted to find it. Kind of branch out a little bit about you and everything that you've done. Sorry, it was a. Uh, sorry, I'm having. There's lots of great comments here, which is always. Yeah, it's busy. It's good. Good, 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 good yeah. stuff. Oh, here it is. It's from uh, Scott Dieterly, who's been on my channel. Um, somewhere outside of Normandy, um, that you've learned about or learned more about. That you. Oh like God! Be. Yeah. No, I mean. Eastern Front, Far East, Burma. Um, I, I, I'm actually not very well traveled. I mean, the, the, I have not been to many countries. Lots of battles I haven't been to. I've been to Normandy a lot and a lot and a lot lived here. Arnhem, Ardennes. Um, I, I haven't been to Eastern Front. I haven't been to North Africa. I haven't been to Italy. Um, so mm. I, I, uh, I've done Malta, Sicily. Uh, but Sicily's technically part of Italy. But yeah, no, lots of them. Um, and, and the Far East and the Eastern Front particularly. Um, and yeah, my, I, I've, I've shifted in the last year and a half from being a primarily Normandy guy to a entire war guy, which is re right, right. revitalized my interest. Cause it, it got to the point where I wasn't buying many books anymore. Cause like I had so many books on Normandy. There was not really anything within Normandy that I didn't already have a resource on. It was like, yeah, okay, yeah. I don't yeah. but now. Of going the other the other fields, it's just it's it revitalized this. Like, I hope I live to be 150 years old so I can get to read about <laughs> all the battlefields I want to read about. So, yeah, yeah, well, that, that's similar for me because and and you had a, a well amazing show um, with Eugene Sledge's son. Yeah, that was what uh, December. <laughs> yep. Coming back next month, he is. Well, I was gonna say that is people always ask me like, oh, like people ask me Canadian, like what Canadian battlefield do you want to see, or they'll just say battlefield, and then I tend to surprise a few people because I want to see Pele Luke because yeah reading his book Eugene Sledge's book sorry is just I mean it's crazy <laughs> it's just I don't know it's just it's that battle is stuck in my brain and well he said he's going there and he's going to be on the show right am I correct that he's he's going there uh we've got we've got someone who lives there who's going to get us get us brand new video footage of the locations where Sledge was and then Sledge is going to talk over that and the guy who's in in Pele is going to join in the conversation as well, I think, hopefully. Um, well, that's, that's amazing. the plan. Well, um, seeing any video of it is amazing because I've only seen a little bit because it's just the sun easy to get to, right? Um, yeah, you know, so yeah. That, that's the plan for that one there. And I'm just reading um, Sheldrake's comment about the Abbey Darden, you know, going mm. back to the garden there. And that, yeah. that there's that's an, that's an interesting thing. Uh, actually, another way of answering your question about what the tourists feel. There's a couple of, going back to Brettville Lorgers as well, there's a bakery Right. right beside the little lane where all the oh, photos yeah. of the 12 SS guys yeah, are. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and they know they have two types of two types of client go in that bakery. Those that live there who go in to get their eclairs and their baguettes, and people who are stopping off to see the photos of the SS. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just fancy an eclair. While whilst <laughs> I'm looking at that photo, and they've now got an information board, and since you were there, yeah. there's an information board in the lane now. Yeah, you, totally there's right. that photo, there's that photo, there's um Otto Funk, I think his name was the guy there. Yeah. Oh, I fancy a cake after all that looking at Panther Tank. So they give they kind of give you a look of you're just here for the SS photos, and you kind of do a yeah. And yeah. And, and, and and Sheldrake making the point that the staff at the Abbey Darden kind of 
they're, 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 they're more than happy to people to go in there and there's where Kurt Meyer was, here's where the prisoners were. But they kind of want us to say to our groups, tell them this is an abbey for a thousand years where there was lots of worship and education. Mm. And it's a place now that has conferences and there's a library there. And it's, you know, yeah, for a few days, there were some really shitty things happening here by some really shitty people that we mustn't forget. But wouldn't you, could you put, kind of put it into the context of this building's longer history? So right. that's something I would always do there is, is remind people that this dark hour where murders took place is a very short part of this building's life. And I, I kind of, as a resident of Normandy, I try and reinforce the idea that you're seeing a battlefield. The French farmer who lives there is seeing the field where his cows eat grass and it makes him a living. So he can put his, you know, by his, putting money towards his pension. So it's seeing, yep. learning to see the same environment through different lenses, you know, right. and, and it's, and it's, again, it's okay to stand in Brett Valorgas and be in gar, gar, aghast at the action of the Panthers being knocked out, and then it's not it's not inappropriate to then go and have a cake if you want to have a cake. Well, I have a joke that when I buy a cake, I tend to drop them on the floor. Yeah, I don't know why yeah. you seem to really bad luck, especially there, because <laughs> the gravity seems to not like you in that particular town. Um, I don't know what it is, but I was going to say I have a similar story because when we were in, in, in Afi, we we met. Um, I can't remember if she was there at the time. I think she was, or she was there after came right after the whole unfortunate massacres that happened yeah. there. But, and we met her and obviously heard her story and everything, which was amazing, but there's an amazing bakery there too. Like you feel kind of guilty, but also those people, it's a town that people live in. They need to make money. It's not a bad thing that they're doing something good. Yeah. And it's really good. I mean, it might've changed. I don't know, but. Um, uh, yeah, no, I mean, and I, I make, as you, as everyone knows, I'm a hat wearer, mm -hmm. um, and, and I tell people that, that during their, their time with me as a guide, they will be wearing metaphorically different hats. There will be times right. when you're wearing your emotional hat. So emotional hat is when you're not thinking about objectives gained or, or lost. You're thinking about right. parents receiving telegrams that their son was killed in a battle. That, that they're, the, they're the emotional things. Twins where one lives and one doesn't. There's the then the analytical moments where you can honestly appraise a commander's performance and say, I wonder if it wouldn't have been a better approach in this on the left flank rather than the right hand flank. And right, right, right. more artillery would have been you. So that's when you've put your emotional hat aside a bit and then you put your analytical hat. And then it's actually, I need, I need, I need, I need, I need a coffee now. So let's go and have our having a coffee and just, yeah. you know, and, and you, you change your hats during the course of the day. And, and sometimes after something very dramatic, when you've, when we, or you've acknowledged a massacre or something, you know, you have to lighten the mood. That's maybe when you're driving the next stop, you do a joke, you know, yeah. and it's not that you're trying to, you're, you're trying to um, dismiss what you've just done. You've just, again, they're paying you for a good day out. I mean, one of the things I, on a Canadian tour, a one day Canadian tour, a lot of people, the last stop they would do would be the Abbey Darden and the garden. Right. And I would find that very difficult to drive people back and say, well, okay, then that's it. You're leaving people with this idea. If they're going to, they can have, yeah. People were, sh and 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 then the injustice of let's not go down the rabbit hole. The injustice of Kurt Meyer not being really made accountable justice, and then okay, we'll go and have a nice pizza yeah. then. So I would yeah. always finish again. I would say to him, "Wait, don't worry, folks. We're going to finish this with a kick-ass Canadian victory because I would not want to take you back to mm -hmm. a hotel with a feeling of oh my god, everything ends in doom and gloom." Mm -hmm. So we would do. I would no matter what time you know, I'm running late. Still do Brettville Laurier, so you can say, and here's where the Panther knocked out. And I, and this is when you know, truth and uh, because I sometimes I would sometimes I wouldn't I would make the point that some of the very perpetrators of crimes were killed the very next day in a mm -hmm. kind of a you know, yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying, what goes around comes around kind yeah. of way. And and mm -hmm. so, the, these are the as a guy, the, the ability to kind of keep people's moods appropriate and, and colin is a master of this as well and mag is very good when she's on a tour uh, of bringing in the french story and the, right. and the you know the, the nuance because I, i'm I'm, I'm talking too much when we just shut up to me to shut up is that one of the questions mag always gets is well your parents were your grandparents in resistance uh, and <laughs> the mag does the kind of well there are people in the resistance and there are also collaborators and in the middle are about 97% of the French population who are 
judging it on a very much daily basis yep. where the priorities are feeding themselves, keeping their family alive and kind of just bracing themselves to survive. What's but, coming, and, what's, what's so, coming next, basically? What's yeah. coming next? Um, but people want to put a label on things. Um, uh, you know, again, like when's the end of the Battle of Normandy? How many people died on Juno Beach? And what type of yeah. gun is that? And yeah. is the Tiger tank better than the Sherman tank? And, and, and those answers that that aren't easy to answer, you, you can just go yes or no, <laughs> but yeah. that's not what people want. So, no, it um, isn't. They want, they, I don't know, maybe it's another rabbit hole, yeah. but I mean, the whole, how do I say this? The technical stuff too is not my specialty by any means. I don't pretend it is. I mean, it comes up and I get asked all the time, but like, well, what about this? Or, you know, what about the specs of this? I'm like, it's not my specialty. I don't know. I know generally, but like, I know people that focus on that. And I, sometimes I feel like it, it just misses some yeah. of the story. Um, it's, I mean, I mean, it, yeah. Sorry. There, Sorry, yeah, it's just, I mean, sometimes to me it depends on the context or yeah. what's being talked about or how they're coming about it. I mean, like, sometimes it just misses the point. Yeah. Um, to me, that happens. I mean, again, just thinking about the Normandy battlefields and, and how that fighting developed and everything. And we've talked about this as well. Like, sometimes the 12th SS bested the Canadians, right? That happened. But other times we, you know, they, the Canadians blew them away almost literally. So it's just, it's not about, you know, the Tiger tank better or, you know, but this That's is this, this idea on. that you're 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 aware of as I am is this the pendulum not just sitting in the middle where it has to it's it's, all, it's constantly being forced left and right. right. So so it, it it everything is either the 12th SS were an elite yeah. German unit that were fantastic. Oh, they were hopeless. No, neither of those statements are true. Yeah, but they had moments of 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 pretty good success they had moments where they were thoroughly bested they and the canadians had days where they were doing really well and days where just circumstances so but there's a need to swing that pendulum to worst best uh elite yeah. awful yeah. and it's like no the, 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 the nuance is in the middle somewhere can we yeah. not just agree that they they elite is a t is a terribly loaded word anyway oh, yeah. you know um what does it mean everyone's interpretation is different but formidable perhaps is a better word or um um i don't know it, it, i don't think it is a better word but it's the nuance it's explaining yeah. that there's there are good days and bad days and uh, what yeah it, it one of the the, the things i that live with me for a long time is is judging people by one event you know it, right. it's Judging Michael Vittman by Villa, Villa Bocage as opposed to judging him by his entire military career, judging Simmons by one operation. You look at the look at the context, look at the learning curve, look at the, it, yeah, it's yeah, I, I get what you mean. Yeah, it, that makes perfect sense. And it, well, that's why I think Normandy is really interesting from that perspective, is because, like you said, that it's literally pendulum swinging back and forth, back and forth, back and forth the whole time. We were already talking about the end dates, whatever. We can throw that out for a second, but it's it's. It, 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 to me, it illustrates it in a very almost clear way, even though that battlefield is so confusing. <laughs> Other than like urban environments, it's like, more confusing than others, right? It's not, you know, you're not taking a trench to a trench. That's not what's happening. But I mean, that I think that's a good way of illustrating it. That, that, that conditions matter, terrain matters, what happened that day matters, right? Who, you know, all of these things are important and they get lost in internet discussions and people get hung up on certain points and it just, it kind of misses a lot of it. And I, and I think that, that what tour guides do is, is very helpful in that sense is, and especially the way that you're thinking about it. And it, it's a great way of thinking about it. And also again, your channel brings that nuance in that, that some people don't well, like. I mean, and this is, you know, but your channel and my channel is, this is the, the, the format we're in, which is similar to guiding is you don't have to offer a, a complete conclusion. For, for a PhD yeah. or you, there, there has to be some kind of point to your thesis. You can't just kind of let it just <laughs> yeah. run out of words, but we can, we can literally stop a live stream because well, we've done two hours now. Let's go and let's go to the pub. We haven't, we haven't concluded, made any conclusions. We haven't definitively decided anything. We can just, we've had a chat and we've gone, we still haven't really discussed. We haven't come to a conclusion as to why, yeah. why Sherman fireflies were better. Or we, we, you just throw an idea around and that's, mm -hmm. I like this idea that you don't have to have a conclusion. You don't have to decide, folks. You don't have to make a decision of who the best general was. You don't have to make a decision right. about was there a particular was there a particular pivotal moment that changed the outcome of the war. You don't have to just keep on learn, just keep on reading and learning, and allow your ideas to develop and change and morph. You don't have to make that definitive statement. If someone says to you in a pub, 
what's your favorite aircraft? You can just say, I don't have one. <laughs> it's okay to say, you know what? Yeah. I don't know. I've mm -hmm. read about different ones. Like they had different strengths for different purposes. And, you know. I get asked that all the time. And I'm like, eh, I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah, just, like, why does it matter? Like, it, and my version today might be different because I might literally tomorrow evening read an account about P-51 Mustang doing something so awesome that if you ask me the question after that, I would give you P-51. But the day before, I might say, Lysander, because I've read about an SOE oper operative being dropped. Right. I, you know, it's there's no need. You don't have to draw conclusions, and I think that's that's this that's something that's healthy about where we're going with this understanding of history is that yeah. we, we can just keep throwing ideas around, and yeah. no one is essentially wrong with their opinion as long as they can put a reason behind it. And we can have someone come on who says Patton is the best general of World War II, and Patton is the worst general, or Simmons or yeah. Montgomery, and if they've got a case, you can. You can make that case, and 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 it, you don't have to decide at the end of it that one is right and one is wrong because they're both right and they're both wrong. Right. I mean, well, that's why, like you just said, we can be like, yeah, that's it. Or I've said that to guess them. Like, you don't have to have a conclusion. Some people get, you know, worried that they have to do that. I'm like, this isn't an academic conference where some, you know, thirty, ten, you know, thirty year practicing tenure professors can be like, you're wrong, and here's the reasons why. You yeah. know, <laughs> just be like, we're done. <laughs> This is it. We're done. It's over. <laughs> we'll see you guys next time. You know, which I think. Well, that, is... I mean, that's. I mean, we're in an era now where I was just having dinner earlier. We're, we're, there's not going to be much new to come out about World War II. Nothing that's actually going to completely change anything. Right. Probably. Probably. Um, the archives have been scoured. The battlefields have been walked. The personalities have been studied. What we are going to learn is we're, we, we're going to learn the in, the uh, ability to discern. We're going to learn how to learn. We're going to learn how to assess, learn how to, 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 to take on board ideas and throw ideas around and consider them again and, and, and learn from that the tools to learn. Um, mm. and, and that's something that, the, where this division between academic history, popular history, tour guiding history, museum right. history, there's an overlap between them all and they're very interesting and, and there's parallels between them. And, and I don't like this approach that one one avenue is better than another avenue or, you know, as I said, right, two right. of I us have come at this from very, very different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And yet we can have an interesting conversation. Hope for people are still there listening to us, watching us about this from those different points of view and both of our points of view are valid and it's better that you know you asked about the qualification in normandy right is that the half of the guides who have the guide conferencier badge have a lot of them have been through a course so they've been taught mm -hmm. perhaps by the same instructors uh, right. with the same books the same book list the people going to teaching and uh, learning under john buckley and wolverhampton or david o'keefe or you know the, the other guides in Norman, well, we've got we've got ex poet, we've got poets. There's a there's a the ex guy who's in foreign legion. There's a there's a there's there's a an actor. There's people from um, theater. There's a monk. You know, there people all different backgrounds. I was a fire juggler for a summer once. That's my <laughs> weirdest job in the past. But so, but the more the more different backgrounds people have, and you put them in a pub and throw them the idea of so what went who. Was anyone at fault in the Falaise Gap, or mm -hmm. did, how did the British develop armored tactics? What was the Canadian? What was the problem with the Canadian use of so and so? The more different backgrounds those people have come from, then the more the more more exciting the conversation is, is because they've been they've come from a different they've come from these different backgrounds. Right, and I well, I was going to ask you about that in that sense. I already know your answer, but I did want to just touch on it because your show. And this is, you've said this multiple times, and it's quite clear of what you're trying to do with different backgrounds. Because there was, uh, I don't want to get into a bit of Twitter thing, because there's always a stupid Twitter fight, but about who should know what to do this kind of work. And, and I go, that misses the point completely. Because like you said, if we don't have different perspectives, it, it, I think it misses so much. We miss different understandings of different ways of going about historical events and why there's motivations and then the, what even led to the history being written itself, I think it's missed a lot. Uh, and I think your show does a great job of that because you have people from all over the place, literally. <laughs> like yeah. you're, They're literally from everywhere. Like you did Australia, New Zealand, right? So that was interesting for the time changes. <laughs> and I mean, yeah. I did, we did the Hong Kong one. It was a 1 a.m. Yeah. for me. Yeah, I think. yeah. it was, it was an odd one that, yeah. I mean, and that's, but that, it's important know, to me. Yeah. 
that that you know the, the, some of the, my favorite shows when people who just run a website and have done for twenty years and yeah. they're a postman by day or they what they drive a milk truck whatever it would be you know that fine what what's the problem with that it's about it's about knowledge it's about an, about having an, a view of things and mm-hmm. you know sure it's it can't just have anybody who's just you know watched a war movie come on but if you've done some kind of work into something you've got an yep. opinion you've got and, and it's not again it's not like we're trying to say with any of my shows or your shows this is it folks this is the definitive <laughs> take this is right. it's just a it's a pro it's a step it's a process watch this and then disagree with something you say agree with something you say and and, and carry on the, the process of learning and understanding and I, I change my mind on things all the time yeah me too and there's nothing wrong with it and i tell that is it's okay to say I don't know. You know this idea of the the, the 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 gaps, not bringing religion in, but this idea of back in the day when people didn't understand how things worked, they invented things to superstitions, superstitions to to fill in the gaps. What, what, why? You know that 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 rabbit is the spirit of something. That, that's people want to know how to fill mm-hmm. answers in. Yep. But it's okay to say you don't know. It's okay to say, you know, people wanting to understand what kind of person Hitler was. And right, right, right. As far as I'm concerned, we don't have enough raw data to go on. We have his book, which is all over the place. You know, unless you could get 20 psychiatrists to sit with Hitler over 30 years and examine what's going on, and even they would give you 20 versions. So does it matter if he's asexual, homosexual? Well, it doesn't, uh, atheist, Catholic. Yeah. yeah, there's no that we cannot draw any c- conclusions. We can go, yes. So just it's okay to say we don't know why Hitler was a complete Hitler. You know, that's it's okay to admit yeah. we don't understand everything. I mean, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. And I, I, I mean, the, the big one for me is well, right now <laughs> there are people disagreeing with you right now uh, about good. the archives. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, well, t- yeah, I, I'm there's not saying. Yeah, I, I read what Trent Talenko said. Great, yeah. great, great support and guest on the show. I'm not saying there's not archives. I don't think there's anything that's going to abs. You know, we're not right. going to suddenly have a document saying, you know, what Stalin didn't exist. It was actually yeah. a, you know, a, <laughs> yeah, yeah. a puppet. I see what you mean. So. Well, I, I completely understand what you mean. I, I like you've said about me in the past. I'm in the archive all the time. Like I'm going next week. Um, I'm there all the time. Yeah, there's little. I don't know. Maybe it's like the bigger picture. Like yeah, you just said Stalin didn't exist, or you know, like oh, whatever. Like certain ports didn't matter. Like that's not going to happen. There's going to be smaller things. There'll be more insight into why people did what yeah, they did. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we will refine. Uh, but the the the, yeah. the basic the basic cornerstones of how World War two was fought a kind of in place now the basic yeah. broad sweeping statements and right. battles and campaign we're not going to sadly find out there was another massive great land battle that you know yeah. half million people we didn't know well, about it's funny they, they say it that way because i've had people you know raise this again and know sometimes a little trying to you know trying to you know do the ah, i got you but it's like there are certain things we don't know or we're never going to know right because their, people are dead and get those stories with them but things like and i use this it's a silly example but it's it's the way i think about it is d-day was june the 6th we know that <laughs> you know yeah. that's the thing that's not going to change that's a definitive thing and, I'm, and and i use that as an example being like yeah the different parts like yeah then they hit the beach at 710 instead of 725 whatever or like we know Dieppe was the 19th of August. Like that's what I use that as an example because yeah. people tend to want to try and pick apart just to pick apart things and how we understand them and going about that. And I think that's where the archives are important because that's a different way of doing it. And I think it's obviously I value that because it's what I've done for the last six plus years. <laughs> but it's it, it's just to me it's it's an interesting way of thinking about it and and, and not closing your mind to things like that. I mean, so that's I've, I've always thing. been the believer of a kind of a, a tour guide, my own personal historical mantra, so to speak, is that mm. a site in Normandy has four levels of, of interpreting it. Okay. The first is why it was a position that was fought over in the first place from the right. point of view of before it happened. So let's right. use Pegasus Bridge as an example. It, the only crossing point along with Horsa Bridge of the, the canal and river between Caen and the coast, therefore to get reinforcements to the British, Sixth Airborne Division, it had to be seized. That's and if you go there without having explained why that those bridges are important, you've missed the context. There's mm. the, the, then the second that's that's the why was it important then? Right. Second level is um 
the 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 the, de- the 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 detail the which airfield they take off from how what's the wingspan of a glider what time did they arrive at which airspeed was the glider coming in at who was piloting this one who was in that one that's detail then the third there is the personal experiences of the people there so what was the glider pilot feeling how what why was a german soldier mm. on the bridge what what circumstance was he was it yeah that and then, uh, and then the fourth level is the interpretation of it post the event of perhaps we didn't need to go there at all because there were mm. no explosives on it. Perhaps we could have avoided that. So, yeah. so when you're on the site, right. I do one and three, but I try and skip two and four because one mm. is you can't take them there without explaining to them why these bridges are important. Right. But you don't want to get bogged down in telling them that they uh, that they took off and they travel for 83 miles on this co- co- uh, course. Then they change 17 to get that's yeah. deep. They don't care. They'll have forgotten that a minute later. Yeah. But while you've got them there, you want to kind of tell you, and this is when John Howard is putting himself through the, will I be able to do this? Um, I've got to hold it. Put it, put it, put yourself in his shoulders and the weight of responsibility he feels he's going to hold this bridge for maybe yeah. Yeah. 12 hours. Yeah. And then the post-event analysis, that you do at the pub or you do when they got yeah. back home in an email. Yeah. yeah. And they yeah. thought about it and they go, actually, if you said it wasn't actually wired for demolition, maybe we could have used those troops better to actually land up on the high ground. That's a good discussion. Mm-hmm. So four levels. Yeah, I see what uh, you mean. And you can extend that to Hong Kong, to, to Market Garden. and Any of it, really. I mean, yeah. you can do that right down to where I mean, where I'm from. It's a more of 1812 battlefields. Like they're yeah, small exactly. in comparison, but you could do the same thing till you know, you're blue in the face. Now, I, we're getting close to our soil. I'll wrap this up. But you have books next to you. So that's kind of, you said show and tell. So yeah, I, I just... You use. I'm wondering, like, what you think about the ones that you use. Yeah, I just, I just pulled out a few of my kind of favorite Canadian Normandy books that I feel are kind of essential part of my bookshelf, just because I was here. So the first one, I'll yeah. get, I'll get, I'll get the plug in for our mutual friend David <laughs> O'Keefe. Yeah. So Seven Days in Hell. It's an, it's a, it's a, it's a particular aspect of the Black Watch snipers as part mm-hmm. of the very uh, Ridge campaign. But David O'Keefe, we all know. Master historian builds a story very well. Lots of detail, lots of information. Bit of a read, considering it's kind of one unit over the course of a few days, but really, really, really good insight into one unit. Yeah. Um, next exactly. one, yeah. David Burkerson, Botan of Heroes, Calgary yeah. Highlanders. Yeah. Lots of good stuff. Totalized, tractable. The July August battle. Just a really good written book that 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 sheds a uh, light on a unit that we don't kind of think about all the time. Um, I'll rattle through these. Uh, yep. Murder at the Abbey. Yeah. I think until someone does something better, the definitive book about the the murders of the not just the Abbey but the the Audrey, the yeah, yeah. It's 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 not an easy read, folks, yeah. in the sense that there's lots of nasty detail in there and court processes and yeah. and you're kind of yeah heavy going and and I don't think it's that easy to get now, but. It's not. That's something I was going to say. Some of these books might be not easy to get anymore, unfortunately. Yeah. And that, that's definitely one of them. In which case, I apologize if they're hard to get. Uh, <laughs> well, absolute look, essential like, reading, like, Guns of Normandy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Classic account, George Blackburn. And we never talk enough about artillery. And yeah. it We've got Gunners the, working right now, so got to make them book. happy. <laughs> got to um, make the Gunners happy. Yeah. Um, the, uh, Fields of Fire, Terry Cobb. Yeah. Um, Probably the 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 premier of his generation, a Canadian historian, maybe overtaken a bit by the David O'Keefe's these days and yourself and stuff, but a masterful. I wouldn't read. go that far, but okay. <laughs> yeah, so um, great. Um, it's amazing. Again, yeah. D Day Battle Diary, mm-hmm. Ch- uh, yeah. Charlie Martin, DCM, Queen's Own Rifles of Canada. Um, easy to nip through one. Good personal mm-hmm. story there of a guy who was there and did it and great personal memoir. A great, great um, to use. Yeah. Great have. Great uh, one that I don't agree with everything in it at all. Um, mm. I love Brian Reed, no holding back operation totalized. Um, as a Brit, I read this through a British viewpoint. He writes it from a Canadian. So yeah. we have some national pride kind of buttons. <laughs> that I would go, you're going to read seeing that from a Canadian point of view, because I know I'm seeing it from a British point of view. Yeah. We're talking Michael Vittman in this particular yeah, case. I, but, I, yes. But really <laughs> good. That happens and then all, finally, the time. all the time. Um, again, our, another mutual colleague of ours. Well, we mentioned Terry Cop, the Canadian yeah. Battlefields in Normandy guide, Terry Cop and Mike Bechtold. Um, which is if you haven't, if you can't afford a private tour guide, 
It myself. takes you through the Canadian battlefields in Normandy. There, there's your how to do it on your own kind of thing. I expect yeah. you could do with a new addition. There's probably some new roads and monuments that aren't in it, but yeah, really good. Um, it's a good one. It's it's one to get. Uh, even just and it's not too expensive. I don't think you're in Canada anyway. It's it's not too which usually for us things are more expensive, unfortunately. But uh, but yeah, those are those are some great books. I mean, there's all kinds there. Um, there's some new stuff hopefully coming out. I've heard some rumors, but nothing official. But uh, but yeah, so this has been a great chat. Thanks for coming on. I really do. No, I've enjoyed it. I mean, I've, so, as I said, I'm, I'm taking a bit of a break from my channel for a couple of weeks, coming back next week. So it's been nice to have a chat again. And, uh, yeah. and you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's gratifying to see that people are now viewing history less through their national lens. And if I'm mm -hmm. doing a show about Australians, it isn't just Aussies watching it. And if you're doing it about Canadians, it isn't just going to... We all need to get out of that habit of looking at things right. through our through our lens, um, yeah. and that's where this kind of format and YouTube is gonna is gonna open that up. Um, yeah. And understanding that we do we do have our prejudices, and I have to kind of kick mm -hmm. myself and stop looking at this from a British point of view. Stop, you know, looking at this from the 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 the, um, the, the, the way we were brought up. And in my case, and I know some of the people watching this who are my age and older, you know, you accepting that you've you're, you're stuck in a rut a bit and that you mm. and that you've you've got these ideas and think where, where did that idea first go in my head and can i start challenging that idea um and and cliff has just sent me a couple of books is watching uh, that i'm going to read about how we kind of convince ourselves of things that we want to believe that aren't necessarily right. true you know and 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 be prepared again to to just take on board stuff and admit you don't know everything and go and, and, and be proud, be pleased when something blows your mind. Cause it just mm -hmm. means you're still excited. Don't see well, it as a, as yeah. a weakness of your lack of knowledge. She is as a, as a road to enlightenment that, Oh, I didn't know that there's more <laughs> things out there. I don't know. Well, that's, that's what I was going to say. Cause obviously by the name of my channel, right. It seems limiting, but I try not to think about it in that way because that's been part of the scholarship or the academic angle of this, but also with what you're doing and how people go about it is we get stuck in the silos and the ways of thinking about it. One of my goals is to try and blow this up a little bit being like, yeah, Canada's there, but we're stuck in our ruts. We're stuck in our ideologies. We think we're better than everybody else in a lot of cases. And a lot of the cases, that's not true. We are not better in some cases. Sometimes we're much worse. And that's something that we don't like to hear in this country, unfortunately, but it's just part of the truth. So that's just something that I think is a great way of thinking about this. So um, I forget, what's your next theme week coming up? It's Rise of Germany, right? Nazi Germany. Rise of the Third Reich. So yeah, yeah fairly. So Von C conference, um, the, yeah. the, um, the, the Molotov Ribbentrop pack, uh, Pact. Um, It'll be a true uh, third right education kind of heavy one to start off yeah. again, and then and then into that we go. There's there's, there's Pacific uh, footsteps in the Pacific week coming right. up. Another tank week coming up. So loads of great stuff coming up, and uh, I'm I'm grateful that these historians keep saying yes to come on and talk to me. Uh, I don't know why they do, but they they keep saying yes. So it's really good. Well, as a historian myself, I know we just don't like we just like to keep talking. So we'll take any forum we can get. <laughs> <laughs> just talk yeah, it's it's, it's just the, the need to be loved, I think, isn't it? And, yeah, uh, need, yeah, and you know, and it's and it is. I still have to kind of pinch myself that there is a format for people just listening to people like ourselves rabbiting on for for two hours. It's yeah, it's, it's surreal yeah. on one level, you know. Is, people could have gone and watched a Quentin Tarantino movie by the time they've been talking to us, but they're listening to us, and it's fantastic they are. And yeah. and I like the idea that people are going uh, uh, challenging their ide their their ideas and their concepts. And and it's and it's again, it's it's okay, folks, to have moments when you realize how little you know about something and go, okay, here's the excuse to go and learn about that. And, and well, you yeah, you make a good point. Right. Sorry, this is one. Thing, this is what I want to say, and then I guess we'll wrap up. But it's because of your show and and Phil Blood coming on and his book Birds of Prey. Mm -hmm. I would never come across that. I don't think until in my what am I doing on a daily basis? I wouldn't come across that. And I just got it for Christmas, and it is amazing. Like I watched him on your channel, him explaining how he went about it, and I and I understand already reading going into it what it's going to be. But I was still like, like like you said, mind blown by the way he's done it that story i mean it's an awful it's awful right like you said for the third reich week or the rise of the third reich it's awful but it's important to know and and i think that's just a good way of thinking about this stuff moving forward maybe there can be our little conclusion is keep your mind open 
think about yep. things and try to think about things in new ways and try not to get stuck in a way of thinking, I think is a yep. good way. And again, it's, it's okay not to know, to say you don't know, and it's okay yep. to not have any firm conclusions. It's okay to, to change your mind. It's okay to, you know, the, we, we are, that's the kind of human beings we are, the species we are. It's okay to like one thing one, one week and then read a new book and then go, actually, no, I, I think I prefer this one now. That's, that's, we don't have to stick to our, 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 uh, what we thought one week to the next, we can change our mind. Right. We can be open to it, and we can and take on board that other people's views can be valid, even if we don't agree with them. Um, yep, I think that's a good way to put it, and that's what you do. And I thank you for that. And, and I thank you for the, for doing what you're doing because you know it's we, we talked about it before. There's various people on their different steps of the progress road <laughs> in the YouTubing, and yep. you know I'm envious of people further ahead than me and. People are envious of where you are. People just started their channel today. It's all a, it's all a curve, and we're all somewhere on that. But it's not a race. It's not. It's a marathon, no, not a sprint. It is definitely not a race, and that is something you keep you keep teaching me, when especially when I need to hear it. So good. Well, uh, again, I enjoyed talking that. to you, Brad. So um, yeah, brilliant. All right, so I'm gonna take a page from your book and do a goodbye, and then we'll come say goodbye to you, and we'll give it an end. So thanks everyone for watching. Hope you enjoyed this one. It was great having Woody on the channel uh, and lots of great comments, which is amazing to see. Sorry if we didn't get all your questions. Uh, a lot of great chat in the sidebar. Uh, lots of good stuff. Uh, so sorry if we missed anything. I, I do apologize. Uh, so just coming up next week on the 20th, I think that's Thursday, is uh, I'm having Rick Fisher, uh, Rich Fisher sorry, on the channel. Um, he knows... Uh, a lot uh, about the Vickers machine gun, I think is putting it extremely lightly. Uh, but we're going to be talking about a book that the association he works with, uh, the Vickers Machine Gun Association, is putting out a reprint of a book of a can loan officer serving in the second Middlesex Regiment, Northwest Europe. So that's going to be a really good one. And we'll cover what all that means. We'll talk about can loan. We'll get, we'll, you know, pick his brain about his knowledge about this machine gun. So that'll be a good one. Uh, so again, if you're if you're new to the channel, please do subscribe. Every one of them, like we were just talking about, every subscriber I get helps me to keep going, and that's just how the algorithm works. The more people that have shown their support in the past, the more they're likely to get in the future. So please do and leave comments and like as well. That is very helpful. If you like what I'm doing and want to keep seeing it going forward, please do check out my Patreon website. Uh, it's down below in the description. Check it out, and if you can do a little bit of help every month, it, it helps me keep doing this. And the more and more I have, again, the more I can do this and the better quality stuff I can bring you. So please do check everything out there. So then, thanks for coming on again. I'm looking forward to you coming back. It was part of my schedule there for a while, World War II TV. You're going to give me a midday something to think about while I'm, you know, pillaring away at whatever I'm doing. <laughs> and uh, looking forward to what you got coming up next. Yeah, and congratulations for reaching your thousand viewers and keep on going and just your, what you're doing is important. And thanks to everybody for supporting me, myself and supporting Brad. And just, yeah, it's important. This is there's there's good stuff to be to be to be found on YouTube. And you're part of a of a, of a change of, of, of people, lear people's learning methods. So that's all good. So uh, thanks very much for the invite. Well, thank you for saying that. And uh, we'll see everybody next. So uh, next week, check out Woody's stuff and uh, check out mine. So we'll see everybody uh, next time. Bye, everyone.